Okay, so uh, let us get this show on the road. We have Marco joined us and Terry joined us. We don't have, hey, there we have Terry's face. Hello, Hello Terry. Hello. Hi, Terry. And we Hi, still don't have Margo. I miss you, Margo. I can't see you. Anyway. I'm going to go <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Get back. Okay. okay. Well, Sorry. good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Fred Harlan, and this is Richard Clark. And uh, as I said last week, it's really good to be with you again, albeit on Zoom. Um, and as I said, doing hot science this way is a new experience for Richard and me. So we'll be learning as we go along, and please bear with us. And, and sometimes our internet service develops glitches. So if for some reason or other, Richard doesn't come through at a particular time, please wait on the line for a minute. It should self-correct. We have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Um, here are the top nine that Richard picked for this week. For our top story, apparently superbugs are far greater than COVID for countries in the Pacific. Should we also be worried? And another COVID story, a major COVID-19 vaccine trial has been paused due to safety concerns. Oh. In technology, why is Tesla hiring software engineers to develop car video games? And in materials, they've developed lightweight green supercapacitors that can charge devices in a jiffy. What else might they be able to charge? Car batteries? And in flight, do flying geese have the answer for reducing fuel consumption in flying? An environment energy is a plant-based diet the answer to climate warming. Biology? Would you wear leather-like materials from fungi? <laughs> and where humans like us, there are apparently five types of cat owners. Which are you? <laughs> and in health and medical, are your medications making you sick? So Richard, can you please start off giving any additional Zoom advice you'd like and then getting on to the first story? Okay, well, here we go. Let me get the slides up and go past those slides. Uh, the first story is uh, what we were talking about just before it began. Uh, Superbugs, they say, are greater risk than COVID. And these are antimicrobial resistance bacteria and uh, they, the people who are studying them say that this is the biggest human health threat bar none. Mm -hmm. And, uh, excuse me. So the uh, deal is that uh, they are studying these now in Fiji because though Fiji is a small place, Fiji has the highest rate of bacterial infections in the world. Well, wow. and, and it's partially due to ignorance and partially due to uh, the environment and they don't know what else that it is due to, but uh, they're trying to find, figure it out. So they're studying Fiji for intensely for several years and trying to essentially uh, catalog the kind of super bugs that they can find. They say that these super bugs pose a far greater risk to human health than COVID, and they say they are threatening to put modern medicine back into the dark ages. 
And uh, I hate to say it, but uh, this kind of is the life we're in now. And I'm not sure that I like it much. <laughs> no, so, but we're here. Any no, uh, comments? Do we have any comments on why this is happening? It's always, I think it's the, one of the reasons why it's happening is the widespread use of antibiotics. Uh, I don't know why uh, bacteria are such a problem in New Zealand. I don't know, but it is. Anybody else? Is that the problem that you run into? Remember, you used to take an antibiotic, and they'd say you have to finish the whole thing, or you'll be, or you'll become resistant to it, or whatever that was. The whole idea is you have to use follow the directions, or else it won't work on you. Is that the same thing? No, the that is some little part of it. I think one of the big reasons for this. Uh, bacterial antibiotic resistance is they use antibiotics heavily in uh, raising uh, cattle and poultry. Oh, and uh, okay. it is an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're, you would think there has to be a better solution. I still, I have kind of an anthropological viewpoint and I still think, you know, we've been trying to invent civilization for about the last 10,000 years and we just haven't yet figured out how to do a lot of these things. So we're still, uh, it's a work in progress and sometimes what we do doesn't work very well. Like in the use of antibiotics is one enormous area. And, and heat and humidity I, have anything to do, heat, humidity, and hygiene have anything to do with it? I don't think, so. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, well, one thing, and I don't know how it relates to that or not, but certainly what we've learned over generations is how to encroach on animal life. Uh, We've gone everywhere throughout the planet, and it's almost inevitable, certainly with the kind of traveling we do after, uh, and then with wet markets in different parts of the world, that the kind of viruses that animals have will spread to us. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I assume that that's going to cause more and more pandemics, uh, just because we have no way, given our civilization, or protecting ourselves from these viruses. Now, I've heard that uh, this is worse now also because the natural environment uh, slows down the spread of these diseases. And as we destroy the that environment, then uh, all of these things spread faster than they used to, even without the international travel. The international travel is kind of like a time bomb that we have uh, going for us. And, you know, occasionally it blows up like in the last six months. Yeah. I think also the all use of antibiotics in hospitals uh, for any cure, they use antibiotics, and that creates the resistance, the box that, you know, you can't, there's no more medicine you can use. They yeah, mutate it with them. I also know uh, I've had doctors prescribe antibiotics for viral infections, and antibiotics don't do anything with viral infections. They prescribed it just so that uh, they would be doing something. <laughs> and also, they want to do actually or, or anything so that we can't sue them. Mm. I think you're right. So anyway, it's, uh, it's merely one other problem where we are not living in balance with the environment. Yeah. Right. 
And then another COVID story, um, this, this major COVID-19 vaccine trial, the one from Oxford has been paused due to safety concerns. What's that about, Richard? Yeah, I lost the slide because I'm a dummy. Okay, here, there it is, okay. Uh, so this is the Oxford vaccine that we have all heard a lot about. The U.S. government uh, has invested heavily in this vaccine and they have pre-ordered 300,000 doses. And uh, the problem is they're not through phase three trials yet. And that's where they go try the vaccine with big populations. And uh, one, one person uh, in the trial uh, got sick. They have not officially released the information on the patient or the disease, but the rumors say it's one person in the UK and he has developed a hemorrhagic, I can't read the small print here, transverse myelitis, which is an inflammatory disease that affects the spinal cord. And it's often sparked by viral infections. And it turns out that vaccines are known to cause this, though it's rare. And uh, so, here is the number one leading candidate for uh, the vaccine that is on hold because somebody uh, had some serious disease. They don't know if it's from the vaccine. They don't know much about it. And they're trying to pause the trials and uh, figure out what's happening. There are still other vaccines that are in development uh, altogether. There's more than 150 different vaccines. There's a list of about a half a dozen that together have received more than $6 billion in funding from governments and agencies. And uh, another 300,000 doses have been pre-ordered of these. And but we still will have to see what's happening. And there are some questions about vaccines. They're discovering that there are multiple strains of COVID. And it may be that uh, you need a vaccine for the strain that is around now. They don't know yet. Well, I did read out. this morning that they were starting those tests again. Yeah, this is phase three testing. Oh. So phase three testing, the way it works is they uh, tested on 30,000 volunteers. They do one injection of the vaccine, one dose of the vaccine, wait a month, give another dose of the vaccine, wait a month, and then there's a control group and after they've given the second dose, they wait for the control group to start to see how many people get sick in the control group so they can compare them against the vaccine group. And then after all of that, the vaccine can be approved. That's why it takes so long is that it's uh, to make sure it's safe for the general population. There is this extensive testing. And this testing is on hold because somebody got some spinal cord disease. And I would think I don't want a spinal cord disease if I have the vaccine. And I want to yeah, take the vaccine. So Richard, I, I have a bit of a question. When we see that this vaccine trial is paused, should we be worried or should we be very thankful? Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> 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 resumed it. Times two. Two days after they said it was paused. It's resumed now. Now, my wife says that they have resumed the testing again. Wow, I, didn't, I hadn't heard that. 
Well, I hadn't yes. heard that either. I had heard uh, more stories about the pause, but uh, she just came in and gave me the updated news. And that, that was re that was reported on CBS. Okay. Right? And uh, I don't know. I have a feeling there's some heads that are, that are going to roll over this one. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I'm delighted, del I'm delighted with that, but I was also very delighted that they uh, stopped the trial. I yeah. think our real worry these days is that people will refuse to take a vaccine. And the more uh, things to do to make people feel that they're being very cautious, the less likely it is that people will stop taking the vaccine. So uh, I, I, it's really good that people doing these things are very cautious. That's what makes me worried about some of the other people, like for example, what the Russians are doing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, they, they seem to have announced it in a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Is this it buying their vaccine from Russia? No, yeah. this it looks as though this is from Oxford. Yeah, this is uh, Oxford uh, University is the one behind it. Yeah. Now there is of the Russian vaccine, by the way, uh, they the Russians have told Mexico that uh, they're going to give us uh, a bunch of doses of the Russian vaccine that has never gone through phase three trials. I'm not sure if I want to be the one doing the phase three trial on the Russian vaccine. Yeah, yeah. And I want a vaccine personally. Richard, just as important as the vaccine, maybe more important, is fast testing. If they can get to the point, you know, uh, that you can get instantaneous results, then they can begin to group people that uh, have negative results, you know, for work or for assembly of any kind. That's been, I think that's very important. Yes, yes. And we don't have any stories as a top story about that, but every week, uh, generally, there are one or two stories about the development of one test or another. So I know they're working on it madly. And what they want is a simple test that you can take and then just get the answer within 15 minutes. And yeah. you don't have to go to the hospital or anything to get the test made. That's what we need. Now, I heard that uh, the UK leadership is saying they're going to test everybody in the UK every week. I'm not sure when they're going to start this, but this will be, if they do it, a fairly amazing uh, testing effort. And they're going to have to do millions of tests every week. And I think another very important thing, of course, is slightly differently, is the kinds of things that can do once you do have COVID and right. developing more and more drugs that can deal with that. Yes. So I keep hoping for treatments. And at the top of the COVID news every week, there are two or three new treatments that uh, are being developed and look promising. And a number of the things they're finding out are treatments that they can do with existing drugs. And so that way, then the therapeutic cycle is quick. There are already drugs that are on the market and are available. Anyway, we're hoping. Okay. So uh, if we move on to uh, technology, the question Fred, is, could I could yeah. I just make a request? Sure. Um, I, your picture shows a great picture of underneath your chin down below, and it's way off to the side. Is there any way you can there? That's better. Can you raise all right. it at all? I can't <laughs> so that we're not looking underneath your chin. <laughs> it's uh, it's hard for me to raise it the way I with my iPad here. Okay, you can't put it on something. When I do it, it doesn't really do much. Well, that's better. Well, that okay. is. 
Well, I'll, I'll hold it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wondered if you could do anything, but you know, you could center it. It would be, you know, one, one yeah. step closer. Okay. okay. Anyway, in technology, um, why are software engineers being hired by Tesla to develop car video games? Is that a great <laughs> idea or should we be worried? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> uh, as I made the comment here, I think uh, oh. that it could mean that Tesla doesn't have better things to do now, or it could be that they think it's going to be a big opportunity to uh, you know, get some revenue since you don't have to drive your car, you need to have something to do, right? And so uh, Tesla has put a notice on their website where they are looking for engineers. They actually are looking for uh, three different engineers. They're looking for a video game engineer in their facility in Austin, Texas. So that's where the main development is going to do. They're also looking to hire a full-time gaming engineer in Bellevue, Washington, and then a rendering engineer in Palo Alto. And I guess the rendering engineer is the guy who makes it look real-time 3D and all of this stuff. There's already a big screen in the Tesla vehicles and already they have games that they license from other manufacturers that they say people play only when they're parked. But, uh, you know, anyway, I don't know. Uh, this game, gaming is moving further than I ever thought it would be when you can play the game in your self-driving car. So it's another change in the world. Now there's the something economy. to do instead of actually observing life. <laughs> Jeez. So that's going to be in the front seat, Richard, or the back seat? Because kids could try to <laughs> not be bored. No, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be. Uh, as I say, I wonder if it's for the driver, because the driver doesn't have anything to do in the uh, uh, self-driving car. <laughs> so, Loretta, where's your picture? You know, again, I, th I think my opinion in the background is that uh, Tesla doesn't have anything better to do. And so that means they've already done the things that they think are really useful. But who knows? Tesla is obviously smarter than I am. And so we just have to trust it, I guess. Now, what I hope they don't have is, you know, there are these games like Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> so I don't know if that's appropriate for that environment. <laughs> Phyllis, my camera is broken. That's why you don't see me. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I used to have a problem with my picture not showing. I discovered I should take the uh, tissue away from the camera that I put over it. So that's that's all. That. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I guess you haven't don't have that problem. No. <laughs> In the material section, uh, capacitors can charge devices. And now apparently they've developed lightweight green ones that can charge devices in a jiffy. And so the question is, what else might they charge apart from devices? Car batteries? Where's that all going? Richard. Now, uh, to me, this is actually one of the stories that is a big story for this week. And it's a big story because uh, these batteries that are used <laughs> to uh, particularly power cars, the forecast is they're going to increase in volume by a factor of 10 in the next few years. Electric vehicles 
are uh, growing rapidly and they all take batteries. And right now the batteries we use are these lithium ion batteries, which are not environmentally friendly. And uh, they're trying to find other solutions. Here, the researchers at Texas A&M have developed uh, the, a plant-based energy storage device that uh, will absolutely work to power the cars and they will only take a few minutes to charge. These capacitors are much faster charging than batteries and they're basically have designed an environmentally friendly energy storage system that has superior electrical performance and can be manufactured easily, safely, and at much lower cost. Wow. Uh, here, they are basically uh, depositing a uh, onto metal plates or electrodes, a mixture of manganese dioxide and lignin, which is a natural polymer found in plants. It's what glues plant fibers together and they treat it in a special way and make a uh, sandwich out of these different materials with an electrolyte between the layers and uh, they can have the kind of energy density where you need, where you can pack all this into a small space and then uh, do it for things like cars. And now one of the things, this particular material is light and it's flexible. So they think one of the things you'll be able to do for car manufacturers is basically uh, put it in body panels in the frames of the cars so you don't have a separate battery. The battery is maybe in your door panels or something like this. So uh, you know, it takes less space and is hidden away and is lighter. And this material, they've done this before with other organic materials this material has 900 times more capacitance than the earlier solution. So it's very much better. And, uh, you know, it to me is the most promising of the battery developments that I've read about in the last year. It's organic, it uses uh, materials that are environmentally safe and it's gonna be easy and inexpensive to make. And so I think this technology is going to be a winner and we will start to see uh, it show up in the marketplace fairly quickly. Richard, I can see another very important use for saving alternative energy from windmills or solar cells. If you can save enough of that, you can use that energy when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So batteries are the keys, it turns out, to decarbonizing the economy. Hmm. Okay, if we move on to flight, um, fuel consumption in flying is a worry for many people. And the question is, do flying geese have the answer for reducing fuel consumption? What's that about? Well, you know, uh, these geese fly in formation and uh, it turns out Airbus in uh, 2016 did a test where an Airbus A350 flew three kilometers behind an Airbus A380 jumbo jet and uh, flying in that other one's uh, wake saved it 10% of the fuel. 
And uh, the major cost in airlines is fuel. So Airbus is busy collaborating with a couple of European airlines and the French Air Control Service. And they're going to start uh, testing uh, flights in the geese formation in France soon. And uh, soon when you fly, you might be flying uh, in formation like the geese. <laughs> Any comments? Who's going to be the lead one? They, 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 I wonder sorry, if, sorry. I wonder if like, well, I think like the geese, don't they, uh, somebody takes the lead and then he sort of drops off and somebody else takes the lead. Yeah. So maybe like American Airlines will take the lead. <laughs> and then, and then, then uh, 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 JetBlue has to take over. And <laughs> well, that makes sense. And there won't be one that doesn't get the benefit of the, and, and this way, they'll, maybe they'll all save a little bit. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, when your flight takes off, you may have to wait a little bit in the air so you get the other members of your flight formation up, and then you can head towards your destination. Does that mean they all have to be on the same route? There are lots of questions that I have about the details of it, but to me, it shows just how significant this uh, fuel costs are for the airlines that yeah. they go to efforts like this to save 10%. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Snowbirds pilots are highly skilled. I mean, are they going to raise ever, all the pilots' skill levels to that level? If you have to fly in formation, you have well, to be Independently of working with the uh, French FAA and the airlines, then Airbus is also working on pilot trainings and pilot oh. tools and things oh. like this to uh, make it easy to execute. Because, you know, I think the airplane guys get concerned about doing stuff where one plane might crash into another or things right. like that. You know, well, I wonder, I wonder if they've studied the Blue Angels <laughs> to see how they do. They're a lot closer than three kilometers, those blue yeah, angels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now, I don't think the blue angels were worried about fuel economy, though. No, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to, I mean, everybody would have to be leaving around the same time, and everybody would have to be going to the same place. Yeah. That's right. Or either that, or they figure out routes to take, you know, where we have uh, oh. like highways in the sky where they yeah. travel uh, in formation part of the way. Yep. You know, and certainly we know about this, if it saves the airlines money, they'll try to do it. That's why the seats are so close together. Yeah. I can see somebody taking off from JFK and then and then as they take the northern route to California, somebody jumping in from Buffalo and then from Chicago and that's right. Maybe yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then four hundred uh planes will arrive at uh LAX. Ooh. That's right. At the same time. <laughs> that oh, yeah. Oh. That's not gonna be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> They would probably need more runways, too. They oh. might need more runways, and what they need is more baggage handlers, because otherwise you wait three hours to get your bag after a four-hour flight. <laughs> or they go part of the way, and then they break <laughs> off, and they run to San Francisco and go to San that's Diego. Right. Yes, yes. I think and they'd be right. all different airlines. That's you know. right. Interesting. <laughs> But uh, the other thing that is madly happening to the airlines is uh, we have electric vehicles for cars and we have electric planes that are small planes that are already going into commercial use. 
and mm. we're going to have electric planes for medium planes uh, in the next few years. The medium routes are the ones that are used the most. These are not the international, but if you're flying in the U.S., often now you stop somewhere in the middle of the country, and so you don't need a long-range aircraft. And so the real change that's happening in aviation is they're figuring out how to uh, turn aviation also electric. But this formation thing, I, I don't think I'd want to be an air traffic controller for sure. Uh, no, my God. They were doing that. I wouldn't like to be the passenger. <laughs> Looking well, out the window. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So, Richard, in environment and energy, what's this about a plant-based diet being the answer to climate warming? Now, uh, I think this is actually uh, one of the big stories this week. And here uh, they have looked at this very carefully and publish this in uh, a journal Nation, Nature Sustainability. And it turns out plant protein foods like lentils, beans, and nuts can provide the protein and nutrients that are needed in the human diet. And they use only a small fraction of the land that's required to produce meat and dairy. Uh, they, these researchers have looked carefully at it and they have found in the agricultural uh, land use on the planet, 83% of the Earth's agricultural land use is for uh, growing meat and milk in those products. 83% of the world's agriculture is to uh, grow plants, or excuse me, to grow meat. And that if we, we each of us, reduces and eliminates the meat in our diet, then that 83% of the land can be rewilded and turned back into forest. And one of the things that they have calculated that one of the benefits of doing this is that uh, this vegetation regrowth could remove as much CO2 from the atmosphere as about 10 years of uh, CO2 production uh, on the planet. So we could uh, save ourselves about a decade's worth of CO2 by uh, doing this kind of significant change and use the land to uh, grow trees. They also say that one of the advantages of doing this is right now uh, the carbon capture techniques they're talking about to take the CO2 out of the air are there are a bunch of things they're working on but they are all unproven technology and you have to ask do you want to put the future of the planet in uh, the hands of some untried technology when all you have to do is this kind of change is kind of simple and direct and immediate. And it's something we could do around the planet starting today if we had the will. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Who's got the wheel? Who's got the will? We need well, pepperoni flavor. Pardon? Well, what was that? I didn't hear what he said either. I didn't hear that, Terry. Could you repeat, please, Terry? 
I'm having trouble with my audio. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a problem. I know uh, one of the things that uh, Carol and I have been doing over the last several years is still reducing the amount of meat and things we eat. Uh, I have kidney disease, so uh, there's some of this stuff that I can't do. I can't have beans, and I can only have a limited amount of nuts. So uh, for me, it's a problem eliminating meat because uh, you need protein in your diet, and I can't figure out where else to get it from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, uh, sorry, Loretta, you were talking? No, no go ahead. Um, I uh, thought that the switch from meat to a plant-based diet was already uh, well on its way. Is that, is that not so? I'm sorry, uh, what was the question? I thought they'd already, people, a lot of people had already switched from a heavy meat diet to more a plant-based diet. I think that that is a change that is in process in, uh, places and uh, lot, like you say, a lot of people are aware of this and a lot of people are trying to change. Uh, yeah. We need more of that to uh, be effective and the message I think needs to be a better message about the benefits of doing it. The benefits, by the way, of doing this go way beyond uh, merely saving the planet uh, that also is beneficial for water, water quality, mm. wildlife habitat, and biodiversity. Mm. Mm. And uh, one of the things that rewilding the planet would do also is slow down the emergence of these pandemics. Mm -hmm. So there are many benefits. Now, this article does not talk about the health benefits, but those of us who are interested in this know that there are also health benefits as well. So there are many benefits. We just need to figure out how to do it, and we need to do it on a big scale. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm sorry. Questions around that. Um, uh, I agree with that. Uh, there's probably more plant-based stuff in uh, North America and in Europe than there was before. I'm wondering if there's a huge impact, though, in uh, the Far East, in China and India, towards them moving towards a meat-based diet. It's there they are, like you say, Fred, they're trying, they're becoming more well-to-do and their culture says eating meat, if you're well-to-do, is a thing to do. And so there's more meat consumption in places like India and China than there ever was. Oh dear. So we got to get them. <laughs> Another question I have, Richard. One of the topics you'd raised some time back was maybe we can grow things that taste like meat, in fact, your meat, but it's done in the lab. Right. The question is, how would that affect all of this? Now, there are a lot of things like that that are the questions. Part of the, one of the things that's interesting about lab-grown meat is they've done careful studies with uh, Gen X, the younger people, and more than 70% of the younger people are saying they would not eat lab <laughs> meat. And you know, the thing about food is, uh, you know, we all eat every day. We all have personal ideas about food. There are all these cultural ideas about food. It's an immensely complicated subject. This also has not talked about this kind of change, doesn't talk about the fact that food production, the way we're doing it now, 
is employs the most people in the world of anything. And if you do it differently, all those people have to get a job. Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, I, we went and got a, a plant-based hamburger from A&W. And it was very good, but I mean, you're putting cheese and, and all sorts of stuff on it, so it kind of masks the taste. But then we had gone to uh, Tim Hortons and had their sausage and agar, and it was absolutely terrible. Oh. So I think they have to start um, making things tasting a lot better than they do with plant-based materials. And I think they're working madly on it. Uh... You know, because all these guys want to sell stuff. And so... But people do... Be able to get your proteins in that, though, Richard. If the plant-based meat, the lab meat. Uh-huh. Will you be able to get your protein from that? Yeah, you'll be able to get your protein. The lab-grown meat, they say, will be healthier than the farm grown meat, because farm grown meat has all these diseases and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Fish uh, have uh, heavy metal poisoning and things like this, and the lab grown meat is going to be clean and pure and more healthy. And the lab grown meat uses something like 5% of the water that. Uh, mm -hmm hoof grown meat does. So it uses, it's very much more energy efficient and resource efficient. And for that reason, I think it's gonna be one of the things that is a real solution. So instead of the farm, you will go to your big building that looks like a warehouse and then uh, they are growing the kind of fish meat that you like to eat locally. How about grasshoppers? Grasshoppers. How about grasshoppers? I'm not ready to eat lamb-grown <laughs> grasshoppers. <laughs> now, they tested grasshoppers and things like that. The way they're using insects is to grind it up, and instead of getting your soy burger, they're serving bug burgers. And I see your face yeah. <laughs> uh, smelling at that, Philip. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it's certainly one of the alternatives. I don't know what the health benefits of bug meat are. They have protein. They have protein. That's right. Good. You eat it. <laughs> you can get a sample of it down on the Malacan. Uh, there are people coming up from the south of Mexico, and they're selling, uh, for example, those uh, insects, deep fried insects. Oh, okay. What do they, they look like? They're they look small. Like insects or? They're small insects, and and they have a. They serve it with uh, lime. Wow. Ah, <laughs> lime. Okay. Of course, in Mexico, they would serve it with lime. I had yeah. tarantulas in Cambodia. Oh my and God. they did not serve the tarantulas with lime. I just had the legs, and the legs were kind of crunchy. Some people I saw eating the body, too, and I oh could my make God. myself eat the tarantula body. Oh. <laughs> I think they have a good idea when they start deep frying them. Uh -huh. Deep frying anything. Yeah. <laughs> might, right. might turn the corner on all this. Probably good. <laughs> You can buy you can buy chocolate with ground ants. Yeah. Some places. <laughs> <laughs> it just tastes okay. a little crunchy, that's all. It's not bad. So if we're moving on from what we eat to what we wear, in biology, would you wear fungi leather like materials? So this, I think, is interesting. If you guys have been following uh, the stories that I publish, I've been very interested in biology and in the uh, effects, uh, particularly of uh, bacteria and algae. And I haven't much been thinking about fungus. But uh, here, uh, what the 
material chemists uh, were doing uh, an international team that's led from the University of Vienna. They're making renewable, sustainable fabric developed from fungi, and uh, they're making it, they've made something that is a replacement, an alternative to leather. It has the same feel and the same strength. And basically, uh, the process these guys have developed to make it uh, involves the food stock is sawdust, which is fairly inexpensive, and fungi, a particular kind of fungus, and they mix the fungus in with the sawdust and let it develop for about two weeks. And then uh, they do some further processing to it to press it and uh, put the fibers across from each other. And then uh, they have uh, their uh, leather that's made from fungus. And now the present sources for leather, of course, are cattle. And the problem with using cattle is we're still not sure about that ethically or environmentally. The other sources for leather substitute are plastics that are made from oil. And this is a uh, natural product that uses material that are thrown away and have no value. And you make the, the leather and at the end of their life, they are making something that is recyclable. Already, there are biotech companies that are starting to market material made from fungus, and there are shoe manufacturers that are starting to get lined up. So we will maybe uh, be able to have fungus shoes. I know vegetarians who will not wear leather because of the animal uh, content of it. And this is an enormous change. And uh, they say substantial advances in this technology mean there are a growing number of companies that are producing material from fungus biomass. And we're gonna start seeing those kind of products available. Uh, I first saw something interesting from fungus a few months ago, and it looks like NASA engineers are trying to develop and use uh, mushrooms as the basis for building material on the moon. It turns out it's very easy to take mushroom spores to the moon and then uh, they figured out a way to grow it and make construction blocks out of mushrooms. And uh, that was the first idea I had that there's something up with fungus that we don't know about. Anyway, so are you ready for your uh, fungus life? Any comments? I wouldn't care what it was made of as long as it looked and felt like leather, you know, what's the difference? Right. I mean, it doesn't matter. It wouldn't matter what it's made of for me. And I would suspect its cost is going to be fairly low, that it would be actually less expensive to produce with the leather because, you know, the main ingredient is sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving along, apparently there are five types of cat owner. Which are you? What's that about? Well, you know, there is a lot of science being done today on a lot of different subjects. And uh, these, uh, there's a research team with a research project entitled Cat cat owners and wildlife that is uh, 
trying to study cat owners as a way to maybe make cats less damaging to the environment. So they have figured out and they studied a bunch of cat owners and found out that they are in five different groups. The first they call a conscientious caretaker. And the conscientious caretaker is uh, for concerned about cats impact on wildlife and they feel some responsibility for the cat and the wildlife. The second, the second type is they've called freedom defenders who are people who are opposed to any restriction on the cat behavior. The third category is the concerned protectors who are focused on cat safety. The fourth is the tolerant guardians. And they, while they dislike their cats hunting, they accept it, you know, because cats will be cats. And the fourth, the fifth are laissez-faire landlords. And these are people who are unaware of any issue around cats and cat roaming and hunting. And so I would have to say, if you have a cat, uh, which kind are you? My cat is listening. My uh -huh. cat is listening, Richard. <laughs> oh, I see the cat. OK. <laughs> So, so be careful what you say about cat. Where are you, your honor? <laughs> oh, I, I don't let it out. Uh, we take care of it inside for its own safety. And also, you can get all kind of disease running outside. And so it's in the house. It's a house cat. OK. okay. Now, that makes you an unusual cat owner. Uh, the people who were studying the cats found out when they studied people's attitudes that most cat owners value outdoor access for their cats. And so they're opposed to any idea about keeping them inside. So they're trying to figure out ways where the cats can go outside and be less of a danger to animals and wildlife. They say individual cats don't kill many birds or wildlife, but when you have millions of cats, then it turns out they eat millions of birds. Yes. <laughs> Any thoughts? I, I well, took the test. <laughs> and I think I'm I think I'm the laissez fair one. Okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I don't care. I mean, but I do let my cat out, uh -huh. uh, and, but sh they all have plenty of bells. Okay, so, you have bells on So them. that's a little, you know. Right, that's one of the techniques that they talk about to protect wildlife is bells. There are other colors that are reflective. Uh -huh. It's okay. easier to keep I it. With, I don't with, see a bell on that cat, Johannes, but you keep it inside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be part of the discussion. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad the cat can enjoy Is she reacting? Meeting. It's easier to keep a, a, a dog in, in a enclosed area than it is a cat. I'm, Cats can jump pretty far, right? And uh, even even when the 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 fences and all that big, the dogs won't usually bother. But but cats are really curious, and so they'll go wherever they can possibly jump. They'll go right. And I don't like that because, especially if it's not my cat. And they use my yard for their bathroom sometimes. 
Also, I don't like the idea of cats catching birds, and sometimes they bring them into the house to share with you, and that's that's not yes. very pleasant. I remember a long time so ago. So I think I would be keeping them in the house, but not letting them go anywhere they want. I don't know how you do that, though. It's been years since I've had a cat. Now, about the cats bringing their trophies in, I remember uh, when I was a kid, my mother was having a meeting of the pen women. These are women writers in Los Gatos. And so she was there with all of her lady writer friends. And uh, the our cat came into the living room where everybody was there and then dropped a dead mouse at my mother's feet. <laughs> Well, then, Richard, on to our last story. I, I gather you can tell if you're old when your pharmacist becomes your best friend. <laughs> and the question is, are your medications from pharmacists, are they making you sick? And this, it turns out to be an enormous problem because uh, of for uh, us older people, you tend to take more medications as you get older. And there are a lot of older people with multiple chronic conditions where you're taking medication every day for multiple different things. Sometimes there are people that are taking uh, 10 or more daily medic medications and uh, not all the medications like each other. And so this is a big problem in uh, the USA uh, because of these adverse drug reactions, unexpected medical problems show up. And uh, in the USA among older people, there are 1.3 million emergency visits every year that are due to drug interactions because of these drugs. And about a quarter of those, the people are hospitalized. Ooh. And wow. uh, they, it turns out that uh, when you investigate this, it, there are three different phenomena that are involved. The first one is uh, what they call a prescription, a prescribing cascade, where you take one drug and you have a side effect, and then you take another drug for the side effect, and then it goes on from there, and you start taking more drugs to fight the other drugs. Uh, another problem is uh, that they have found often is somebody taking two types of medication for the same disease and they are meds that usually are prescribed by two different doctors without knowing what the other one is prescribing. So you have uh, double entries. Another part of the problem is what I would call user error. People not an understanding what the basis of the prescription was. For example, there's a, a patient who is taking an allergy medicine, but he's taking it year round and he doesn't realize he should just take it during allergy season. So there are a bunch of different reasons why people may be taking meds that compete with each other. And like we know, in a lot of places in the world, the doctor is not looking at this well. There are some places where the pharmacists take responsibility, and that seems to be a fairly good system. They have also found that with older people, 
there are some patterns uh, of abuse. It turns out uh, some of those are with blood thinners, opiate, opioids, painkillers, and uh, medication that require routine monitoring, such as blood tests, and they don't continue the monitoring, so you don't know it. Also, there are some medications that affects your mental abilities and abilities to think, particularly sedative hypnotic drugs like Zolpiderm, diazepam, and alzapron. So there are some drugs that you can take that zap your mental capabilities and are particularly dangerous. So anyway, uh, this is one that if you're taking multiple medications, it is worth uh, figuring out if uh, you need to take each of them. And if there are any drug interactions, there are resources. The American Geriatric Society has uh, a document, the Beers Criteria, which is a document where they interact, they show various drugs and their interactions and things. Hopefully your doctor, your pharmacist, or somebody knows about this and is taking care of you. How many medications do you take a day? Any thoughts? The last two that you uh, mentioned uh, were for anxiety. You know, one of them I think is the um, Valium and the other one is Xanax. And uh, <clears throat> It wouldn't be a good idea to take both of those at the same time. But I heard, I uh, recent, not too long ago, the doctor gave me two different medications to try to, uh, well, I have an irregular heartbeat. Anyway, they were, they made me sick to my stomach. Well, I wasn't gonna take something to make my stomach feel better. I just stopped taking the medications. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So as far as um, doctors that don't know what are going on, if there's a couple of doctors and then a pharmacist and everything, in Saskatchewan, uh, our health department has a system now, and I think they're in several places around the world, where all of that information, all your tests, test results, your medications, your visits to the doctor, everything is recorded into your file, electronic file. And if I happen to go to a doctor in Mexico, I can get the information and put that on my file as well. That's right. Well, they all have this information. They'll, they know when you've been to a clinic and, and uh, it's not hidden anymore. Oh, that's great. There's another important thing with the medicine. I had a knee replacement done in Spain and I had one United States. The one United States, they send me home with 80 little opiotype pills for pain. Uh, you're not allowed to have pain in the United States at all. <laughs> that, that makes people depending on these. Uh, I threw out most of them. Can you imagine 80 pills? Uh, I could have become an addict to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the medicinal, medicinal companies, they have been pushing that. Mm -hmm. um, they tell the doctors, you've got to prescribe this. And somebody's making a lot of money out of this. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I think part. we know that. Yeah. And certainly we know the all these pharmacy companies spend a lot of money on doctors getting them to prescribe their latest drug. Mm -hmm. As well as television advertisements. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That ought to be banned. Yeah. Tell your doctor about this. <laughs> right. Okay, folks. Well, nice to see everybody again. And we'll see you in a week's time. Okay, terrific. Hey, thank you both for organizing this. This is a fun one. I yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Fred. Bye, Bye folks. Oh. Here, I'm glad you all came.
Uh, I think it's important for us to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're, we're we're mental health for mental health. That's right. <laughs> for mental health. Adios. Right. Adios. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. bye. bye.